Right there, I think we're just about ready to start. It's great, thanks everybody. Um, I see we've got a naughty corner developing up on the back corner there, so we might look to split them up. Um, right, well, it's really great to see so many old and new friends, and thanks so much for coming along today um, to be with us in this really great location and a beautiful building. Um, there's such a lot going on with everybody. We know how busy everyone is, um, so we do really appreciate you taking the time um, to come be with us for the next two days. And in this 100th year of community ownership, it's really great to look back and to celebrate some of the achievements. And we're hearing from three fantastic community owners um, about what they've been up to um, in their journey. Um, but also to look forward. Um, so discussing what more we need to do um, to achieve more and to embed ambitious land reform at the heart. Of uh, we've got some really amazing brains and thinkers and doers in the room today. Um, so it's not just a two-day jolly, despite what Meg might have sold it to us. Um, so we are going to need your feedback and comment. Um, uh, we've got a new app called Mentimeter, which I think everyone will have been um, given some details of when you registered. Um, and please do use that to give us feedback um, on the sessions or share any comments um, and also to share thoughts and ideas. Um, it's fair to say that the people with the orange lanyards won't know what you're talking about if you ask them about Mentimeter, <laughs> but the people with the pink lanyards, who are the staff team, do know. So if you've got any, if it doesn't seem to be working, if you've got any questions, please ask Meg or Carrie, that would be great. So just moving on to a few housekeeping things before we get started. Uh, first of all, can we thank our main funders, which is Scottish Government um, and um, Highlands and Islands Enterprise, main funders for the conference and also to Tudor Trust and the William Grant Foundation, who are great supporters of our work, particularly in the urban areas, and they've supported um, our conference and also some attendees today. And thanks also to the Scottish Community Alliance, who um, funded the great trip to Noidart yesterday. And for those of you that want to tweet, the hashtag is communityland23, so please take any opportunity you can to share what we're doing here. Staff are also going to be taking photos, so I think that's Meg mostly, and anyone else? Heather as well. So if, if you really don't want your photo taking, if you could let Meg and Heather know, but otherwise I'll just be sort of wandering around um, taking photos. Um, we're going to be live streaming all the sessions that are in the main hall, so we've got some extra microphones, um, so everything will be going out um, live. Um, You've got a map in your delegate pack, so we've got four workshops in each session. TDC is this um, uh, room here in the main conference space, um, and there are three breakout rooms upstairs, Egg, Canna and Run. So Meg tells me on the back of your um, lanyards should be details of which workshops you're in and where the rooms are to go. So if you can please try and stick to the workshops that you originally signed up to, because I think space is quite tight. Um, so that would be really helpful. Um, again, if you can go straight to when the workshops um, are on, if you could go straight to workshops, because again, we've got quite a tightly packed agenda. Um, most of the workshops are at capacity. I think that's right, isn't it, Meg? So I think that's all the main things. Do I need to say anything about fire alarms or anything like that? Okay, there's no fire alarm schedule for today. Um, okay, um, the fire evacuation notice is displayed in the room. Okay, <laughs> um, and don't leave your bags in the aisles. So um, I think that's all I had to say to start off with, but I think what we really want to do is get on with the session today, and the first speaker is Julia from Koyak, um, and Julia's here with colleagues today, and she's going to be telling us to get the conference off in the perfect way, all the great things that community landowners are doing and want to do. So I'll invite Julia to come and join me. Thank you. <laughs> depending on where you're from. Um, if you just start with oops. You've gone the wrong way. No. No. <laughs> Hang on. Oh. <laughs> right. Okay. Um, welcome to Shangri-La, uh, second best Highland community. Um, you know, we sometimes refer to it as God's own country, but actually it's um, two big landowners' own country. Um, 
it's a typical crafting community. Uh, a lot of it is in common grazing land, which has its own complications. Um, and down close to the, the, the sea is all in sort of crafting tenure. Um, but we're kind of chipping away at it. We've, we've um, acquired a few bits and pieces along the way. Uh, we started in 2010 uh, to tackle quite a lot of the sort of usual highland problems, depopulation, falling school roll, uh, lack of access to land and housing, and it was getting increasingly more difficult for people to live in the area. And that came along with um, the, the change in the legislation as well. You know, that meant that there were doors of opportunity to knock on. And we started by being funded by HIE, which enabled a group of volunteers to get together uh, and have one employee. It's a, a job um, that currently I job share with my colleagues. Uh, so we retained community interest and then eventually we kind of dropped it and kind of put it on the back burner. And it was on the open market and we hummed and hawed. And then eventually last year we thought, well, let's just go for it. It's a huge price tag, but we reckon that it was a worthy investment in the future of the community. You know, if you looked at it as a former croft, it was a lot of money, but it had planning permission. It's a great site. Um, there's planning permission for nine houses. Even though we've actually, we've raised the, the spine costs and we've got a grant from the Scottish Land Fund to do that plus our wind turbine money is going into the pot so we've got it's still not been uh, smooth sailing there's been a few bumps in the road however you know fingers crossed the last few months of the last year has been a white knuckle ride because it's been on the open market at any point it could have been sold and somebody did nearly buy it for a holiday house but fortunately well, fortunately for us, unfortunately for them, their house in the south of England, the sale fell through and they had to drop out. So, fingers crossed, if all goes well, we may be taking ownership next week. So, if that, <laughs> with any luck, I'll be able to come back in the future and we'll have housing and families living there, which will be a, a game changer for our community. That's, that's it, really. <laughs> All right, okay. I don't need that money. Yeah. I think the phrase that stands out there for me is white knuckle ride. Yeah. <laughs> I think we've all been there where you start out down one path, often end up going off in a completely different direction from where you thought. Um, but... I think we'll hear from all three speakers, community speakers, that actually communities are absolutely not risk averse, absolutely ambitious, they're very outcomes focused, they see where they want to get and they're prepared to bulldoze through everything until they get there. Um, and I think that's always what's really inspiring. Um, that it might take a long time, but actually you always generally get there in the end. So now we've got a couple of minutes if anyone's got any questions um, for Julie and all the great work they've been doing at Koyak. You're just all completely overwhelmed with <laughs> what you've achieved. Um, I was going to tell them to go over there's quite a lot of pussyfooting around. <laughs> what do you think has been the biggest challenge for you as a, a relatively small community? I'd say in some ways manpower. You know, there's only a few of us, and it's largely down to volunteers who are already pretty committed doing a lot of other things. That's also a kind of strength, you know, there's a kind of follow-on from the kind of crofting, the historical arrangement, you know, where people got together and did things because nobody else was going to do them. Um, and I suppose just everything's a learning curve. You know, we'd start on something and then suddenly you'd find there was some other requirement, you know, or oh, you need to buy a community interest company or... Um, uh, you know, jump through various hoops that you weren't aware of. And who have been sort of the key partners? So you mentioned Community Housing Trust, obviously, but who else have you been working with along well, the way? Highlands and Islands, and they 
Highlands and Islands Enterprise right from the beginning. Uh, Communities Housing Trust, um, the Land Scotland, of course. Um, now you've put me on the spot, of course, I won't be able to remember <laughs> entirely. And what are the skills, do you think, in, in creating a really positive, good partnership? Because you're not always going to agree on everything all the time, are you? Tea, I think. It's a good Um I think, well, communication, you know, we're going to try, you know, we try and meet up with people and get to know them and establish good sort of communication and, um, and invite folk over to have a look. And so a lot of it is about sort of selling your story then, do you think? Do you, I mean, do you think communities are good at selling their story? Or is it always a surprise to people when they turn up just how much you've actually done? It's a mixture of both. I mean, I think sometimes people within the community don't even realise how much they're doing and they're maybe not so good at articulating it. And, um, you know, putting it into the kind of language that, uh, you know, I've worked for a local authority and everything before and you know, one of the things that attracted me back to living in the Highlands was... Um, the fact that people felt that they kind of had to sort of power themselves or they felt um, there's a kind of welcome absence of hierarchy, you know, that you know, we can go and speak to somebody as much as the next man and, um, and a kind of healthy disrespect for... Um, it's also about healthy disrespect for rules, or um, you know, that's the way it, that's the way it was. So that's the way we've got to do it. If you'll let us, there's, you know, come on, chaps, let's let's have a shot. You know, I think there's yeah. a lot of that. Well, I think that's a good place to finish on. Apart <laughs> 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 well, from Meg's conference rules, obviously. Uh, so no. Well, can we all thank Julia uh, for agreeing to kick us off today? <laughs> Right, we're going to move on now. Um, we've got um, a pre-recorded video um, from the Cabinet Secretary for Rural Affairs, Land Reform and Islands. And Andy, I should have just put that up and then we wouldn't have had to say which order it was in. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we've got a pre-record, so we'll share that video with you. Um, and then Andy Proudfoot, who's the Land Reform Bill team leader, um, is going to come up and say a few words and just talk a bit about the process um, of how the bill will develop. And we'll have a couple of minutes for any questions, but we have actually got a sort of detailed workshop um, where we'll be able to have more sort of in-depth discussion. So, if you're happy, Meg, thanks very much. I'll get out of the way. Good afternoon to you all. I'm just so sorry I can't be with you in person today. But I would like to start by acknowledging the work of Community Land Scotland and your members. So many, I'm sure, are gathered in Sky today. You provide that voice to existing community landholders across the country while also inspiring and supporting those communities looking to become landholders. Community ownership is at the forefront of land reform. The 2003 Land Reform Act, which brought about the first community right to buy, was truly groundbreaking. It's since provided a route for communities across Scotland to take ownership of land, while also giving crofting communities the right to acquire and control the croft land where they live and work. These were radical changes which have changed so many communities, enabling them to own land and take control of how it's used. Over 200,000 hectares of land, that's 2.5% of the total land area of Scotland, is now under community ownership. And you and your members are at the forefront of this. Last week, I met with Grant and community gardeners who purchased land by asset transfer from the City of Edinburgh Council. They could do this because of the 2015 Community Empowerment Act brought in by this government, which introduced a right to buy abandoned, neglected and detrimental land and extended the right to buy to include urban communities. But there is more to be done to support more communities to own more land. Recent times have seen high land values. The latest Scottish Land Commission report on rural land markets highlighted that this continues to be a significant challenge. I understand that communities may feel that they can't match these prices, but I would appeal to any community with ownership aspirations to take the plunge and ask for help and support. 
there's a vast array of organisations out there to provide guidance, not least Community Land Scotland, as well as the Scottish Government's Community Land Team. Granting Community Gardeners were able to fund its purchase by an award of over £80,000 from the Government's Scottish Land Fund. Since 2016, the Scottish Land Fund has approved over 300 funding requests, bringing almost 25,000 acres into community ownership. Over 1 million people across Scotland now live in communities where assets have been acquired with funding from the Scottish Land Fund. We are committed to ensuring an increased diversity of land ownership, and that's why we're putting more funding into the Scottish Land Fund. I recently announced an increase in the fund by a further £1 million for this year, and I'm proud that the Scottish Government is doubling the fund to £20 million by 2026. We will ensure that every group who expresses interest in applying to the fund is given our full support to assist them in making an application. The majority of applications are for smaller projects. Last year, the average size of grants awarded was £160,000. In my new expanded role as Cabinet Secretary for Rural Affairs, Land Reform and Islands, I welcome the opportunity to continue to work in partnership with all those who help support thriving rural and island communities where people want to live and work. The First Minister underlined this approach in April when he set out to Parliament the Scottish Government's three driving missions – equality, opportunity and community. These missions will determine the priorities of this Government. The First Minister was clear that these missions are vital to everyone, no matter whether they live in rural, island or urban Scotland. He emphasised that we'll be taking a tailored approach, fully reflecting regional circumstances and working closely with our partners in rural and island areas. While the First Minister said that we'll use the powers of devolution to their maximum to deliver services and improve the lives of the people of Scotland, he also emphasised that we will make the case that with the powers of independence, we can do so much more to ensure that Scotland will be wealthier, fairer, greener and a more equal country. This government will continue to set out its case for independence and Scotland's right to choose our own future. As we look to the future, within the First Minister's statement, I've committed to introduce land reform legislation. This new bill will build on our land reform measures to date and will complement existing community right to buy mechanisms. We'll further empower communities by providing more opportunities to own land, as well as giving communities more say in how land in their area is used. I also want the legislation to further improve transparency of land ownership to help ensure large-scale land holdings deliver in the public interest. I'm just really sorry that I'm not able to listen to your discussions on the proposals this weekend, but I'm glad that the Bill team leader, Andy Proudfoot, is able to be with you and I look forward to hearing that feedback. As you will know, we consulted last year on proposals for the next land reform bill and received well over 500 responses to the consultation, which we published in December. Thank you for waiting patiently on the fuller analysis of those responses, which I'm delighted to announce have been published this morning. I want to be clear that I consider such consultations to be an essential part of policy development. It's critical that we hear from the full spectrum of those who have an involvement and interest in the work, such as at last summer's series of public discussions. But this engagement and discussion will not end just because we finish the formal consultation. As our development of the bill progresses, I intend to continue to work closely with stakeholders, including Community Land Scotland. I want to make sure we introduce a bill that's ambitious, it's balanced and robust, so that we might achieve our policy aims in a proportionate way that's fully in line with human rights legislation. Turning to the proposals in the bill, while we have made progress in land reform since devolution, much remains to be done. We need to continue to bring about a more diverse pattern of land ownership while making sure that those with the broadest shoulders bear the greatest burden, helping us to meet our targets for net zero and biodiversity. The 2016 Land Reform Act brought in our Land Rights and Responsibilities Statement. The statement reflects the Scottish Government's aspirations for community empowerment, as well as how land use and management can support the Government's targets for net zero and biodiversity. The proposals in the new bill would put that statement on a statutory footing for large-scale landholders, to ensure that best practice by landholders becomes universal. I know some landholders proactively publish plans and strategy documents and actively engage local communities in decision making. The proposed requirement for land management plans is intended to bring all of these up to these standards. The plans will provide a basis for engagement with local communities over land use decisions that affect them. 
We want to bring forward new measures to regulate the market in large-scale land holdings, including the introduction of a public interest test. It's essential that those who buy and invest in property do so understanding that comes with rights and responsibilities. The prior notification proposal in the bill would seek to build on and complement the existing community right to buy framework. It would give community bodies advance notice that a landholder intends to sell their land. It's not intended to replace existing legislation in any way. A community group who is particularly keen on a particular piece of land or building should continue to exercise their existing statutory rights under part two of the 2003 Land Reform Act. All these proposals would apply only to large scale land holdings. We proposed a 3000 hectare threshold in the consultation, but I appreciate that there was a wide range of views on this. I'm clear that our land reform objectives for greater diversity of ownership are not incompatible with our net zero and environment ambitions. All landholders, whether that's public, private, community and charitable, are capable of working together at a landscape scale in order to realise those net zero ambitions, irrespective of the scale of individual holdings. I would just like to close by thanking you for this opportunity to speak to you today. While I sadly can't be with you, I wish you a very successful conference and I look forward to meeting many of you in person soon. Thank you. And, and review, I think as a board we've got some work to do in terms of how we might take some of those ideas forward. But can I invite now Andy Proudfoot up to say a few words on Scottish Government? Thanks Andy. Thank you, um, Elsa, and hello, nice to see you all. Um, as Elsa said, I am the, the Cabinet Secretary, I am the Land Reform Bill Team Leader at the Scottish Government. I just joined um, the Scottish Government in, in October last year, so I'm relatively fresh to being a, a civil servant. And when Elsa was welcoming us all and she said that this conference is full of people who, are, who have brains, thinkers and doers, and I suddenly felt very small, having been something of a newbie in this role. So, as Ms. Gujon said in, in that um, word to us just now, I'm really, and it sounds a bit cliched, but it really is true that I'm here to, to listen and to learn um, from you as this conference um, goes, goes forward. I'm keen to speak to you at the, at the breakout session on some parts of the bill um, later as well. And really just to report back as Ms. Gujon said, the engagement with the bill is not just ended because the consultation responses um, have, been, have been published and analysis done. It's still um, the process is, is continuing as we seek to, to really um, develop and, and hone the proposals. As a civil servant, my job is to support the minister in, in making those decisions or the cabinet secretary. But uh, they're the decision makers. I'm just here to, to sort of provide that support and assistance. And so what I learned from this conference, I can help um, put back into that process. He also asked me just to outline a little bit about the process as we, as we, where it's come from and where we think it's, it's going. So I'll just do that for the next few minutes and then very happy to take questions. So just to give some background to the bill, it was part of some uh, manifesto commitments of the parties ahead of the 2021 uh, Scottish parliamentary elections. And when the government was formed, it went into a cooperation agreement with the Scottish Green Party. And part of that, known as the Butte House Commitment, as I'm sure many of you um, know, was a, a commitment to bring forward a new land reform bill. Uh, the bill stemmed from some reports from the Scottish Land Commission. I know there's a few um, from the Land Commission here uh, today. So the Scottish Land Commission's role is to give advice to the, the government, but it's for, the, it's for this government to develop um, that, or take that advice and develop it and, 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 and take it forward. So the government consulted on some um, potential proposals for the bill last year. As uh, the Cabinet Secretary said, we got a great response, um, about 540 individual responses, and obviously a lot of um, groups responded as one, obviously Scottish um, Community Land Scotland um, um, gave a response that we've given a lot of thought to and we're continuing, continuing to consider those responses, the analysis that's been done and to see how the proposals might develop um, from that. 
But again, further engagement is still to come, um, and it's just likely to be more focused. The consultations obviously went out to, to everyone, it was to for whomever, and um, further engagement will, will continue. Once we get to, once the bill is, is developed, it will be obviously introduced to the Parliament. Uh, I came as a, as a committee clerk from the Parliament, I know a few of the, the members here, uh, and I used to be there to support committees as they helped um, or they, their role was to scrutinise Scottish Government policy. So I'm now seeing it from the, from the other side. Um, but the, the bill, once introduced, will go to a parliamentary committee. They are known as the lead committee, and they will look at the proposals in the bill. They'll probably do some more engagement on that. Uh, Elsa has Elsa's attended a few committees in the past, so um, maybe, maybe doing so again on this. And they're really testing... The, the proposals to see if they'll work as this the direction we want to go in. The committee will um, publish a report. Um, it will go to the Parliament to decide whether to take to, the bill can move forward in the parliamentary process. And if that's the case, then it goes to the amending stages. And those stages are, are when members can bring forward amendments to the bill to make new proposals, to change things, to tweak things. Um, those are all voted on. Um, by first the committee and then it goes to the chamber and it's only then that the bill is finally decided on by um, all MSPs to decide whether it should um, become law or not. So the parliamentary process is another chance for you to engage in the development of the bill and the proposals. I think that probably is a quick journey through um, where we're at but Again, as Elsa said, very happy to, to, to take questions. And then after that, just to, to keep listening and learning, the big ideas that are coming um, and more throughout the, the conference. I'm here um, till tomorrow and just keen to, to, keep, to keep listening. So thank you. Thanks very much, Andy. Um, and, yeah, we were really keen for... Um, for Members' Day to hear what the process is of the bill um, and that the consultation that uh, has been, the, the responses that have come out today, you've got an opportunity to look through those and see what the main themes are. Um, but um, as Andy and, and the Cabinet Secretary said, that's not the end of it. There's still opportunities to input um, if more ideas are coming forward or certain things that CLS and its members are keen to see in the bill and not included, then there are still opportunities to bring forward further um, ideas. So we're not at the end of that process. Um, we're about halfway through it, I would say. So, um, But we've got a few minutes for questions. So um, if anyone has questions to ask Andy, as I say, we have got the workshop where we'll sort of get into the nitty-gritty. But if there's any um, high-level questions people want to ask Andy, um, about the bill and where it's going. Yep, lady. At the, oh, lady at the back, who's actually Bridie, who is a lady as well. Sorry. <laughs> months ago. Yes, the, the, the three um, pieces of legislation that you mentioned there should, like, they, they are, they are, should, um, they are interlinked and they should support one another and complement one another. Obviously, you touched on the community wealth building um, bill, which I think just the consultation for that only recently closed, um, and they're doing their own analysis of that work. Community wealth building is, is really putting um, into law sort of the, the pillars of, of 
what's seen as as good community community wealth um, builds it. One of those is is land and property. So the proposals in the land reform bill should really reflect the the principles behind what will be in the community wealth building bill and sort of setting that pillar into to legislation. So they they certainly should should complement each other. And there's lots of discussions in, in within government. Um, no, no bill team is an island. Uh, we're there to 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 keep um, speaking internally and how that impacts on 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 those proposals. I'm, I'm very much <laughs> aware. Um, obviously, I knew from your, your time in the Parliament and uh, as the, the convener who went through the 2016 Land Reform Bill now Act, um, I'm aware that you've got a, a, a massive pool of, um, of knowledge in that area. So thanks, Rob. Can I, this is me, um, it's meant to be looking like I'm deflecting here. Uh, I'll need to just double check what the, the consultation analysis said with that and could I catch up with you in, in a Outside, and I'm not. This isn't me trying to hide. I just the, the, the there was about 50 questions in the in the bill, and I also we published the consultation analysis, but I just can't remember the, the figures for that. And I don't want to, to misquote and send people down um, a rabbit hole. That's that's not it's not right. So if I, if you don't mind, and I'm happy to report back as well, um, Elsa, if I can try to deflate. No, no, Questions, Josh? Yes, that is very much the commitment in the Butte House Agreement. The First Minister's policy prospectus when when he became First Minister, um, Mr Yousaf just re-emphasised the, the commitment of the government to bring forward the bill. Um, in terms of the challenges, obviously trying to hone the proposals. Uh, Miss Guzman wants to bring something that, as she, as she said, there is, is robust and, and will, will make a difference. Uh, so that's really our focus just now is to, to hone those proposals from the from the technocrat side of things that I am I'm, 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 there's a lot of moving parts to developing legislation and it's my job to, to make sure those moving parts um, come together and don't clash and cause cause issues so I suppose there's the obviously the Scutions, um, political drive there and I'm here to, to try and support that and make sure the Brilliant, thanks very much. Um, thanks Andy and thanks Julia um, for opening our conference today. Um, so thanks Andy very much. <laughs>
she's been very busy talking to journalists today, so she's um, got lots of interest in her ideas. Who doesn't love talking to journalists? <laughs> Let me start by thanking everyone for coming and thanking Community Land Scotland for holding this conference and for inviting me to speak. It couldn't be a more important time for us to be having this discussion. Land and who owns it is at the heart of so many of the crises facing Scotland today. From food production and climate change to housing and energy, land ownership shapes modern Scotland as it has done for centuries. So to make real changes, we need to change the distribution of land in Scotland. But to date, this has proved difficult because Scotland's land market is almost completely unregulated. Provided their bank balance is big enough, anyone can buy whatever land they want with no questions asked. And so we've seen a multi-billionaire become Scotland's largest landowner in around a decade, buying estate after estate with no barriers. This has led to Scotland having some of the most concentrated land ownership patterns in the world, where 0.025% of the people own 67% of the land, we have to recognise that land ownership must change. So what can we do? We must begin by recognising that the private land market has failed to regulate itself and that government must intervene. We need a properly regulated land market with an empowered body to oversee large land transfers. And we need a presumption in law that new ownerships of land do not exceed 500 hectares. And we need a well-designed public interest test which takes into account local and national interests. But it's not enough to set standards if they're not enforced. So we need a regulator that has the power to bring forward public interest tests on all sales over the presumed limit, on all sales representing a majority share of islands, and on existing holdings where there's concern that the public interest isn't being met. Because public interest should be at the heart of decisions around land to ensure that the economic social and environmental rights of people and their local communities are met. If large landowners cannot show that they are meeting the needs of Scotland's communities, then the regulator must step in to support them to do so, or if necessary, to intervene itself. This enhanced regulatory approach would aid community ownership and increase accountability for the big landowners. And the need for that accountability deepens each year as huge tracts of land are sold for so-called carbon credits, a practice which may appear to meet some environmental goals but often doesn't align with our national and local long-term interests. Instead, we end up with private companies like Shell using Scotland for carbon offsetting so they can continue to pollute elsewhere in the world. So we need clear principles set out in law to guide our understanding of public interest, to ensure that land supports our <coughs> communities, not a greenwashing agenda of big businesses. And we need land regulation which prioritises sustainable food production, affordable homes, public energy generation, nature restoration, and community wealth. That's why next week, I'm proud to say I'll be launching my consultation on a proposed Members' Bill, which seeks to go beyond the Scottish Government's Land Reform Bill in strengthening community rights to intervene on land sales and ownership. I'm expecting a broad range of responses and I would encourage everyone here to share your thoughts on the consultation. But don't stop there. Take the conversation as you already do out into your communities. Speak to your friends, your families. Take it into your workplaces, to your colleagues and to your neighbours. To conclude, Scotland's land ownership patterns 
concentrate wealth and power in the hands of a few. It's past time we change those patterns of ownership because land is a finite resource and we cannot allow it to be wasted and hoarded for private interests. We, through our public sector, own huge areas of land used for forestry, recreation, and increasingly for climate management. And on top of that, some communities have already taken land into community ownership and are managing them brilliantly to reforest, increase biodiversity, and of course, to support their local economy. But if we want to see these changes continue, we need to take action. So by democratizing land ownership, we move Scotland towards a fairer and more sustainable future. And in doing so, we ensure that our land works for the many, not the few. Thank you. Thanks very much, Mercedes, for starting us off there. Um, I'll just remind you again to use Mentimeter if you want to um, uh, share any comments or thoughts on any of the um, ideas you're hearing today and we will have an opportunity for a few questions at the end so um, next I'd like to invite Kate Wimpress from North Edinburgh Arts um, up to speak um, and Kate's got a different perspective but equally inspiring thanks Kate um, thank you very much uh, it really is lovely to be here um, mostly to listen and to learn I'm quite new to uh, community land ownership and to Community Land Scotland. Um, so it's an absolute honour for me to be able to share some of my thoughts with you. Um, so thank you very much for your time and for your ears. So whenever I was preparing this short provocation, I reflected on my personal and professional organisational experience over the last five years and gathered in a bit of research from other think tanks, researchers and forums. And if, if I'm honest, I also worked on a little bit of intuition and hunch uh, born out of 25 years of working in uh, the sector and also from being on the ground daily in a community listed in the bottom 5% of the Scottish Index of uh, Multiple Deprivation. So that's quite a lot to shoehorn into uh, a couple of minutes um, and I hope I do justice to that and to the communities involved. So to start with what I know best, I was looking back over the last four years uh, that it took my organisation, North Edinburgh Arts, to complete a community asset transfer from the City of Edinburgh Council. So the board and the organisation have 15 years of uh, successful operation, a team of paid workers, of which I'm one, a chair who has served as uh, a local councillor for 30 years and uh, was indeed the Lord Provost for a year, and also the ability to wade through the thousands upon thousands of emails, documents, forms, meetings, calls uh, required to make that process work. But even with this resource to hand, um, the first request for an asset transfer was met with just a flat no from council officers, despite, of course, people in this room knowing that the asset transfer element of the Community Empowerment Scotland Act aims to change that balance of power between communities and the public sector. So we nearly gave up on that process over the years, but we carried on because research showed us that 97% of our local community backed our plans. Um, it has to be said, we were slightly anxious about what the council were planning to do in the future. And uh, if you've met my chair, both she and I are a little bit bloody minded and very stubborn. And we thought, well, if this is our experience, what chance have smaller, informal, more grassroots or newly formed organisations got? So the community I work for and with has been ravaged by 15 years of austerity, the impact of COVID and now, of course, the cost of living uh, crisis. The Joseph Rowntree Foundation No One Left Behind report published in April of this year says, not only has the number of people living in deep poverty increased dramatically, but the depth of poverty that people now live in has worsened too. And unfortunately, this means that one in 12 people in Scotland are living in very deep poverty, which is uh, described as having below 40% of the median income. And those most affected are single person households, households where someone is disabled and minority ethnic uh, households. And that also chimes with the Edinburgh Poverty Report concluded in October 2020. It says in the wealthiest city in Scotland, we estimate that almost 78,000 people are living in relative poverty. The majority are working age, in employment and living in rented accommodation. These are lone parents, uh, most of whom are women, disabled people, carers, and black and minority ethnic families, and they're much more likely to be in poverty than others in the city. So I find those really stark and shocking statistics. 
and, and that report, the Edinburgh Poverty uh, Report, continues, we have heard, perhaps more than anything else, of the intolerable toll living in poverty takes on people's health and well-being. People in poverty told us they are exhausted physically and emotionally. Too many people we met during our inquiry told us they feel that large parts of the city don't belong to them and that many aspects of Edinburgh's life feels off limits. So to do a wee bit of telescoping between 2016 and today, seven years ago, the Scottish Regeneration Forum Manifesto ruffled a few feathers, it has to be said, whenever it stated that despite widespread rhetoric and assumptions to the contrary, most resources and investments are currently directed to su successful commercial centres and wealthier residential areas rather than places that are marginal and poor. And so to get right up to date, uh, at a Scottish Parliament, Constitution, Europe, External Affairs and Culture Committee on the 18th of May, Ilse McFarlane, who's the Director of Built Environment Forum Scotland, said that asset transfers, and in this case she was talking about the transfer of church, uh, church buildings, uh, noted in the Bridging the Gap report on both sides of the English and Scottish border, she said that is demanding more and more capacity from local communities. So if this is true for any community, um, it is much more so for those who are already running on empty. So to get back to my title, Five Minute Provocation, What Radical Change is Required? So my, uh, my proposal is that we get radical by going back to basics and restore the ground for democratic and community, community flourishing, not to fulfil a policy direction or meet a top-down requirement, but as an end in and of itself. Unless an inherent value and supporting framework is uh, developed and put in place for grassroots collective action in and of itself, multiple top-down opportunities will come and go and will always miss their mark. Those at the lower end of the SIND charts have very little to call on in terms of formal, ongoing, open-ended support. The type of support required to harness enthusiasms, build local aspirations and encourage people to put their head above the parapet. Most people in this room will have been through or been close to a community right to buy or a community asset transfer and will know that it can be a bruising and sometimes thankless task. With the status quo, we should be questioning how any community buyouts in areas of need have happened at all. If you've not got the very basics covered, why would you venture into this somewhat alien territory? I stand in awe at those who have navigated this difficult terrain and ploughed on, succeeding, I have to say, in many cases despite the existing frameworks and not because of them. And here I've got to tip my hat to the Cardown Community Meadow Group um, and their inspirational play part buyout, which was ably supported by the Community Land Scotland Hub. And just to close, um, again recently Dr Oliver Escobar from the University of Edinburgh was speaking at another Scottish Government committee, this one for local government housing and planning, and he suggested on the eve of the 50th celebration of community councils that these could be the silver bullet in this respect, but that certainly he has found um, that uh, not in their current, I have to say, atrophied state, but he's found no appetite for um, political capital to be expended. Um, on their reform or rebuilding, despite the real potential there for them to be key decentralised democratic spaces that could, if nurtured and nurtured well, become highly functioning, dynamic, participative and inclusive, reaching out to all those uh, people that I mentioned earlier. So my radical idea is that unless the soil and roots of community development are tended and tended properly to repair decades of deficit, it is inevitable that opportunities, funds and resources will revert to those who have the time, energy and headspace to call on and to carry on when the going gets rough. And for me, that is no bold idea. Kate. Um, I think, yeah, there's a lot in there and lots of us have started um, on, on a journey and we've seen there's been a threat or an opportunity and we've just thought, how on earth are we going to get from where we are to where we want to be? Um, but as you say, we can quite often call on different sorts of resources, um, but communities that are absolutely already exhausted, um, you know, they do need such a lot of support um, and we do need to work harder, actually, to support those communities. 
Um, I think the point you made about community councils is really interesting because probably lots of development trusts here actually came out of community councils originally um, and community councils can be very supportive. Um, they can also not be very supportive because they might be a completely different sort of forum in the community um, and of course lots of places have pretty moribund community councils um, so I know there's some, been some work recently in the local government committee and um, I was talking to Ariane Burgess about it and about the need to actually start thinking about what role they can play given the sort of democracy gap we've got in Scotland um, so thanks very much Kate. Uh, right now I want to pass to Megan. Um, Megan is a Scottish Land Commissioner um, which is a very important role but even more importantly she's also from the Apple Cross Development Trust. Thank you, Elsa. Thank you, Mercedes, and thank you, Kate, for these really interesting provocations. Um, it's great to be here again and to see so many familiar faces and hopefully meet some new ones. I wanted just to say a few words about how we value land. Not in a technical sense, don't worry, I'm not going to take you down like on a land assessment route for five minutes, but more in a holistic and moral and even philosophical way. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, going to, I'm going to touch on and build on some of the work of the Scottish Land Commission, but this very much is my own views. So when, a, when some land or, or an asset comes under community ownership, some people say that it, it loses value. But I completely disagree. I think it exponentially increases in value. But what happens is that we change how we define and think about that value. Because that land, that asset, no longer simply has a financial price tag associated with it gains social, environmental, cultural, heritage, and biodiversity value, and it becomes a source of wealth generation through the stewardship by the local development trust or the organization on behalf of the community in order to create jobs, generate sources of income, build houses, create sources of food, respond to the climate emergency, and so many other things. And because of that, community development trusts and other organizations are already doing what we now call community wealth building through the stewardship and investment in those lands. But in a completely different and parallel trajectory, we've seen the financial value of land become increasingly important across many parts of rural Scotland in the last couple of years, driven by interest from commercial forestry, from natural capital investments, which are leading to very significant changes in land use on the ground. The Land Commission has been um, analysing the impact of these changes in the land market. Our most recent report on this was published on the 22nd of May. It's on our website if you want to dive deep into that. And because these new demands for land are outstripping supply, the price is being pushed up, and what that means is that then Scotland becomes a place which is interesting for investment internationally by those who want to speculate on these increasing land values, which further escalates this problem of of an overinflated land market. Now, I don't need to tell any of you what happens next in terms of the impact on local communities. We have community groups, crofters, families, farmers, all being priced out of the land market. We, it becomes increasingly difficult to get land available for affordable housing and for other development opportunities. And then that makes it even harder for rural and island communities to tackle the bigger problems they're trying to deal with, such as depopulation and the need for economic growth and opportunities. Now given that the pressures on land are only going to increase, we really need to find a way of making sure that everyone in Scotland is able to fairly benefit and equally benefit from these changes in land ownership and use. And, it's, and I think that what is key to this is finding a way of reconciling these different ways of valuing land so that all land is being recognised as having these multiple and holistic and really complex values, particularly for local communities. How do we do that? Well, it's one of the things I think we're going to be discussing over the next couple of days, so I'm really interested to hear what your thoughts are on this. But I wanted to put a few things into the pot first, particularly drawing on international, international experience, because Scotland is, is not unique in facing these challenges, and there's a lot of lessons I think we can learn. So during, the last, during last year's negotiation on the Convention on Biological Diversity, which is the nature and biodiversity equivalent of the climate, international climate conference ag agreements. At that convention, indigenous and local communities were able to win very substantial recognition of their rights and their particular relationship and values um, and connecti connectivity to their land within the new global conservation frameworks. 
equally the, the making sure that we have an equitable way of sharing the benefits from land and natural resource investments with local community is extremely important. And there's a wealth of international experience that we can draw on, ranging from different ways to pay for ecosystem services, as well as um, share the benefits from, from renewable projects. And the ideas of how we can do that are evolving all the time. In the current edition of Nature, there's a proposal from some conservationists to establish a, um, a global conservation basic in income payment for communities who are responsible for safeguarded, safeguarding biodiversity. The Scottish Land Commission is also, has also been doing a lot of work on how benefit sharing for communities can, can, can be done in Scotland. And we'll be publishing some more guidance and recommendations on that over the coming months, so keep an eye out for that. And finally, there is a clear need for better regulation of the land and carbon markets. As there's are strong measures proposed already in the Land Reform Bill that we've heard, heard about from the Cabinet Secretary, Secretary and Andy this, this morning, no, this afternoon, sorry. Um, and, and some of those, I think, are really important in terms of this public interest test for large-scale transfers because they enable a more holistic discussion about the value of a particular piece of land in terms of that piece of land not just necessarily being transferred through the free market but thinking about how that piece of land is valuable in terms of the public benefit it can generate. And interesting is that, interestingly, there is a parallel push within European regulation and also internationally in terms of trying to make sure that companies and their financial investor backers are also thinking about this wide range of values that are associated with the projects that they're responsible for through more, reg more better regulated environmental, social and <coughs> governance frameworks. So I think Scotland is in a really good place to start thinking about how to resolve these tensions. We have a well-being economy which places that holistic values-driven assessment at the heart of government. And we have policies like the Just Transition Framework, which can provide a, a pathway for doing this. The question really is, for all of us, is how do we transform this high-level ambition into practical and pragmatic policies and actions on the ground that can start right now? How do we make sure that the true value of land, not just its financial value, but its, its value for communities, its value for socioeconomic development, and its value in terms of nature restoration is being reflected in all of these policies? Thank you. Thanks, Mercedes, Kate, and Megan there for three really different um, uh, provocations, and, and that's what we were asking for. We weren't sure what they were going to talk about, um, but um, it's great that we've got um, people willing to lead the debate on some of this. Um, you've probably seen that uh, we recently um, published a report authored by Alistair McIntosh, um, the Cheviot and Stag and the Black Black Carbon. Now, it was supposed to be 10 pages, and it ended up at 76 pages. <laughs> uh, so <laughs> it's, quite a, it's quite a chunk of reading, but there is an executive summary we're pleased to hear. But Alistair explores a lot of these themes that um, Kate and Megan and Mercedes have raised today in terms of what is land, what's it for, um, who should benefit from it, who makes decisions about it. Um, some of the um, proposals that are being introduced today, particularly by sort of green financial interests, are really permanent. They're sort of 70, 80, 90 years, and communities are going to have to live with those land use decisions for a really long time. So we're really keen, and I'm, I'm so pleased that um, uh, Mercedes, Kate, and, and Megan were happy to talk today, because we need a debate about this. We need people to be talking about this. Um, to say, uh, you know, have, has there been any public debate about uh -huh. offsetting, about green finance, um, about how land should be used and who should benefit from it? Um, and the Land Reform Bill is a, a fantastic opportunity to start that debate. As I said, we've got the Community Wealth Building Bill, which hopefully will also make people think about where the wealth is in a local economy um, and where it's going. Is it staying locally? Is it being recirculated to create jobs and housing and ensure our young people can stay and have sustainable futures in economies or is it all being extracted? So I think there's a lot for us to think about. And as, as Megan was saying, we're just at sort of the outset of that journey. The market's been moving so fast, it's actually quite difficult to understand what's going on. So I think the Land Commissioner to be hugely credited for their work in trying to unpick 
um, some of this and to shine a light on it. What's become really clear that so many um, transactions are happening off market, so the, the proposals and the land reform around the notification of sales are going to be really important. But there's a lot to do. So we hope when you go away today and tomorrow, you're all thinking about this and thinking, right, how can we locally look at what's happening? How can we make that change locally? How can we add to sort of the national voice and debate around this? Um, because you're all living in communities that are being impacted um, by what's happening. Um, and the Land Commission are putting forward some really detailed proposals, particularly around community benefit. And again, everybody needs to be aware of those. So when you see things happening locally, you can say, well, hold on, we should, we should be having a say here. We should be getting a part of this. The community should be involved and engaged in these decisions. Um, so I really hope those three presentations have, have made you think a bit. Please share any thoughts back on Mentimeter, as we said. But we've got just a couple of minutes if anyone's got any questions. I appreciate they're quite deep things to think about. <laughs> if anyone's got any questions, um, I think we're happy to take them now. <laughs> set up and I'm thinking that they're, they're an existing mechanism that, that touch on so many other things, community planning, kind of uh, health well-being. I mean, there's, there, there are, they could be a, a focal point for this. However, I'm not suggesting that they're the focal point for this. But I think um, to kind of broaden the question out a little bit, I, we need to, we, you know, ongoing space and support needs to be provided as a given, as, as, you know, as not just as a, end of, a, a thing in itself. So, um, and then everything else flows from that. But if, you, but if you don't have, if people don't feel that they have the space, permission, and time to gather, then nothing else will, will happen. But if they do, so if you've got your libraries or your art centers or your spaces, and there's an ongoing um, invitation, then everything else will flow upwards. Uh, but if you don't have that in, in in place, then it's just not going to work. So I suppose I'm, I'm using them as a kind of a, um, a focal point, which could be really reinvestigated to, to reach people. But you've got to go to where people are first, and I suppose that's where the where the arts program and the libraries come into it.
an, of a change of ownership, but it, be, it can be a, applied when there is a concern about a particular estate being managed if it's not in the, in the public interest. So I think that could be potentially a very useful tool to address some of the concerns you raised, Michael. Andy, maybe you want to come in after Mercedes if you want to add anything else. Can you hear me okay? Thanks very much for the question. Yeah, so a um, part of um, the consultation that I'll be launching next week, part of um, that proposal applies to existing holdings. Um, so the idea is that we will empower the Scottish Land Commission to um, intervene on existing holdings where it's believed not to be meeting the public interest. That might be a decision that's taken by the Commission or it might be um, something that's born out of um, public campaigning, a public petition, for example. And then we've proposed a, a process that would be gone through, um, you know, the concerns would be published, um, there'd uh, be an opportunity for a voluntary agreement to be reached um, with, the, with the current owner. Yeah, if that wasn't possible, then, uh, and if that was reached, then conditions would be applied. If that wasn't possible, then it would go through, um, it would be escalated, um, so that we do actually start to see real action and ideally um, the, the deconcentration of, of ownership. Can you project, Agnes? I can project. <laughs> That's very mean, Megan. <laughs> Thank you. 
We're going to workshops now. Um, on page five of um, uh, the brochure, it'll tell you where you're going. Um, if you can make your way there as quickly as possible. We'll probably have five minutes left. So 